your smart devices as we get ready to share the word with you. Timmy didn't want to put his money in the offering plate Sunday morning, so his mother decided to use some hurried, creative reasoning with him. You don't want that money, honey, she whispered in his ear. Quick, drop it in the plate. It's tainted. Horrified, the little boy obeyed. After a few moments, he whispered, Mommy, why was that money tainted? Was it dirty? Oh, no, dear, she replied. It's not really dirty. It just taint yours and it taint mine. It's God's. So it's tainted. Uh, it taint enough. <laughs> Hallelujah. I uh, spoke with one of my friends this this week about a situation, just sharing our hearts and encouragement, and um, he gave me some advice. And through the conversation, he mentioned something that jumped out at me, and I believe it's kind of a responsibility that we have as ministers. Uh, of the new covenant and God's grace. Um, Lisa and I have told you that we, we really desire to help you remove grave clothes and then you can go out and help others remove grave clothes from themselves so that they can be loosed and free. But one of the responsibilities from the pulpit that we should have and we should declare is to bring soul health. Amen. Health to your, and healing to your soul. Uh, when the moment you believe your spirit man was awakened, became brand new, began to live, and is perfect. Yeah, that's right. That's your so, your spirit is perfect. That's what God did for your spirit. But in the the real world, uh, living day to day, we have difficulties, battles, and situations that are dealing with our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. Uh, we have mental issues, we have physical issues, we have uh, di all types of things. So I want to serve you this morning some soul food. Amen. Anybody want some soul food? Amen. Um, what I really want to help us to do, I've been trying to do this over the last several weeks of ministering. I have not preached this for two weeks. We had Jamie Inglehart last week, we had a picnic, so this is the first Sunday morning I've been I've shared and I've been trying to give you a little bit about where we're going and what we hope to accomplish during the message so that uh, we have an end game and we know where we're headed and we're just not out there randomly talking about a bunch of stuff so I want to help us this morning to step out of the shadows and into the light because in the light of God's word and God's presence and God's people together uh, as things happen there's a uh, method of counseling called theophastic uh, counseling. And all that is is a fancy term for bringing things into the light of God. Theo means God. Faustic is light. So we're bringing things into the light of God. And Holy Spirit just dropped something in my spirit. Is John in the air yet? Not. Okay, so he's already flown from Korea to Detroit. So thank the Lord he made it and may he make it safely back to West Virginia in Jesus' name. So I want to encourage you this morning with some information from the scriptures uh, that will help you grow and mature. Lisa just talked about the knowledge of God. You already have a, get, he's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given you the fullness of his grace upon grace. He keeps pouring it out, but a lot of times we just don't have the knowledge of it. So I want to release some things to you that will help you uh, remove those grave clothes that will open your eyes so that we won't be blinded to the things that God has for you, okay? So my goal as we release this, if you will take it, if you will study it out, if you will meditate upon it, and if you will practice it in your life, I believe it will bring health to your soul. And as the beloved apostle John said, I pray that you will be in health even as your soul prospers. And Dr. Caroline Leaf says that 83% of all sickness is because of our thought life. Okay? So if we can have our minds healed, we can actually begin to heal our physical bodies. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, as we look at the comparison trap. And uh, 
as we compare our lives to other people's, it's a trap. Amen. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he says, Oh, don't worry. I wouldn't dare say that I'm as wonderful as those other men who tell you how good they are. Their trouble is that they are only comparing themselves with each other and measuring themselves against their own little ideas. This is what Paul says. What stupidity. It's, he says it is dumb to compare yourself with each other based upon using the measuring stick of the standards that you have set. So in other words, I, I as the pastor, give you a bunch of things, rules, uh, that you have to follow that are standards that you have to measure up to, and then you compare yourselves week in and week out with the person next to you, the person that you teach Sunday school with, the person that you uh, talk to at the coffee bar, and you're measuring yourself up against the measuring stick that we've set for each other as a standard, and he said that's stupidity. Amen. I didn't say it. Paul did. <laughs> Go with me to Luke, the 18th chapter. I'm just going to give you two scriptures as we start this journey this morning. Luke, the 18th chapter, going to give you an example of what Paul was talking about. The Pharisee in the temple in Luke, the 18th chapter, the religious leader stood apart from the others. That's his first problem. He separated himself from the group. He's standing by himself. He's not being apart because together we're better. I, I posted this week, just, just this morning actually, I feel a Holy Spirit strongest when I'm with you. I do. I mean, I'm thankful for His presence in my daily life, but I feel the presence of God manifesting when I come together with my brothers and sisters, even if it's over coffee. doesn't have to be in this setting, but that's when I feel Him the strongest. But the religious leader stood apart from the others, and he prayed, How I thank you, O God, that I'm not wicked like everyone else. They're, they are cheaters, swindlers, and crooks. Like that collector, tax collector over there. So he has separated himself from the group based upon the rules of the old covenant, the law. He is judging everyone else and seeing their evil deeds or their sin against the law. And he's saying, I thank God that I'm not like those people out there that are doing, doing all that evil. Jesus had something to say about that. He said, why do you want to try to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you have a telephone pole sticking out of your, under, uh, your own eye? I call that the plank eye syndrome. So uh, it's easy uh, to compare our messy reality to someone else's perfect snapshot. This is one of the problems and issues I personally believe that social media has presented us. Why? Because you, take, you see someone on their perfect vacation laying out by the pool and they take a picture of their feet with the pool out in front of them and the book that they're reading and you've got this perfect snapshot while your hair's all messed up, you're sweating, working in the yard and you begin to compare your reality to what their snapshot on Facebook was. Yeah, and... Uh, <laughs> We compare our imperfect homes. Stephen Furtick said, says it this way. You are taking your behind-the-scenes footage and you're comparing it to your neighbor's highlight reel. So all the accolades of the highlights that they have run, that, you know, that all their good deeds and their best days compared to your mess behind the scenes, it's just going to cause you trouble. How can we experience joy and satisfaction if we're racking up debt to keep up with somebody else? Um, families, careers, relationships, they don't match up to the absurd standards that we have set. And not only is it exhausting and frustrating trying to keep up with the Joneses, it's dangerous. So what what is your measuring stick? Just... Meditate on that for a second. Some people, uh, beget, they get into the comparison trap and their measuring stick is sin. Okay? I'm not, my sin is not as bad as your sin. 
so I'm a better person because I don't do this, 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 and this. Well, you are doing this, 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 and that. <laughs> and you're com if they compare themselves to you, they might think that they're better than you are because of the things that you're doing because we all have personal convictions. So sin cannot be a measuring stick. It's interesting that when you study orthodoxy, the, the early church fathers, sin was not the issue. Sin wasn't what was being uh, conquered. It was death. Their focus was death. They concentrated on why? Because the wages of sin is death. And if death is what in the garden, eat of the tree, you shall surely die, then Jesus came, and what did he do? He conquered death. I mean, Paul tells us more and more. So the resurrection became the focus and not sin. But when you preach sin, guess what's going to manifest? Sin. But if you'll preach life, the resurrection, victory over death, what's going to manifest? Life. So don't use sin as a measuring stick. People, other people's failures, mistakes, shortcomings. I, I, I hear this all of the time, especially when I get counseling sessions when it deals with marriage they're comparing what he did to she did and what she did to what he did and god forbid if there's been divorce and you compare them to the ex that's dangerous and it just causes problems it's a trap um here's a good one some people use possessions they're using well they have this and because they have this they're successful I, listen I, I'm almost 50 years old and I have found out there are, there are a lot of people that have a lot more than I do and they also have a lot more debt than I have. Okay, So I can't measure up and that's okay. That's their business and they might be able to afford that. But if we're using possessions as a measuring stick, what car you drive, what clothes you wear, what I mean, we, I'm involved with the school systems right now and in the state of West Virginia, they're discussing changing the class system when it comes to athletics. They want to add a class four, and they want to move some of the class A's to class double A's. And what they're doing is they're using a criteria. They have set the measuring stick because they, want, they know the result that they want. And when they set the measuring stick, they begin to compare other schools with each other based upon that measuring stick, and it's a mess. Comparison is a distraction tactic by our enemy to get our attention off of the abundant life. Because if I'm comparing myself to you, then I'm more worried about catching up with you or doing what you've done and uh, obtaining what you have obtained. Young couples fall into this trap. Parents have been married 35 years, both working hard and have a, a nice home, nice cars, nice clothes. And the kids that are 22 that just graduated from college and they're working their first interim job that they're entering into the workforce want the same thing that their parents have and get themselves 60 and 70 and $80,000 in debt right off of the bat because they're comparing their life. I wish our parents could take us back to when they started, when they were 22. And what they did, they had to see some hands raised in agreement with that. And it detracts us from, it distracts us from the abundant life that God has planned for us. Uh, you know, I, I believe heaven is real. I believe that uh, when you step from this life and you take your last breath, you slip through the portal, which is very near into the next life and have your next breath in the presence of the Lord. I also believe that when you re uh, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross of Calvary that you secured your place in that afterlife Amen. I'm not selling you any fire insurance because you're going through hell on earth Amen, I'm going to preach a sermon here soon I'm working on it uh, how to get through what you're going through Good. and avoid hell how to get through it because a lot of people are living hell on earth and uh, uh, the trap has become they've compared themselves to other people and they're trying to catch up with them and because they're trying to catch up with them they've created themselves a hell. The temptation to compare us is as near as our next chat with a friend, our next trip to Walmart, our next check-in on social media and then automatically we begin to, in a conversation, compare ourselves. Uh, I have even in 
probably, let me be transparent, probably this is my biggest issue that I have to deal with personally as a pastor. Facilities, number of people in the church, am, uh, am I as good as that guy? Can I preach as good as this person? How come these people left here? So I'm comparing myself to a lot of different things, and I have a beautiful blonde on the front row that helps me to get out of that all of the time because as we will find out, we all there are certain things we all can do to avoid the trap so that we don't fall into that comparison because if you speak in tongues and I don't, I'm not holier than you and you aren't holier than me. So we even get into comparisons about gifts and how God uses different people in the body of Christ. It's a trap, it's exhausting, it's frustrating, and it's dangerous. Ask yourself these two questions. Number one, do I ever feel jealous around people who are more talented, better looking, have better financial stability, and have more opportunities? If you ever feel jealous in any of those settings, you've fallen into the comparison trap. The second question is, do I allow other people to determine my life goals? If I look at so-and-so and he has this type of car, wears these types of clothes, and I set a goal to have that style and to live in that kind of house, then I've allowed that person to di dictate to me my life goals instead of allowing Holy Spirit to lead me and direct me in my life goals. People are not the measure of my life. Say amen. amen. Possessions are not the measure of my life. Say amen. amen. Jesus is the measure of my life, and I've already measured up. <laughs> Come on. He is the measure of our life, and he said he is already well pleased with you. When God looks out of the balcony of heaven and he sees you, he sees the blood. We're hidden in Christ, and Christ is in us, so the Father sees you and says, That is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. No performance necessary. There's just, you have already measured up. If we can get that in our hearts and in our souls, it will bring healing. It will deliver us from this trap, and we won't be distracted from the abundant life. Comparing yourselves to others can blind you to and bind you from what God has planned for, for you. It's not God. Not God at all. But it, that comparison will blind us because our focus has become comparing ourselves to other people and other possessions instead of just resting in what God has already promised. Sometimes it's even easy to resent God's goodness that you've seen displayed in other people's lives and forget the blessings that on your own life. Amen. So never compare. This is a good one to write down. There's a place on the back of your bullet in the right notes. Never compare your inside to someone else's outside. I'll say that again. Don't compare your inside, what you're feeling how you look at yourself, your emotions, don't compare that to what you see outside in someone else because you don't know their turmoil. You don't know their emotional stress. You don't know what happened at home before they got here this morning. So the par <laughs> this is good. Uh, Noel and I were talking this morning before service. What I'm about to tell you, I post. I had in my notes yesterday, by 10, 30, 11 o'clock, I had things ready to go because I had a wedding to attend last night. And then Dr. Lynn Howes, one of her mentors, posted this exact thing yesterday evening. So I texted him and I said, that's confirmation, thank you. I, I was blessed by that. The comparison trap will leave you emotionally feeling one of two ways. You ready? So if you are caught, caught in this trap of comparing yourself, it's emotionally going to leave you feeling superior or inferior. Amen. When you compare yourself to the bum on the street, you're going to feel superior. You, you uh, compare yourself to a millionaire that's flying around in his own private jet, you might feel inferior. Neither one honors God. Amen. Your feeling of superiority over someone else that may have less or your inferiority because you don't have as much, neither one of those honors God. What honors God is walking in the identity that he's given you. 
being who he's made you to be. And so this comparison, I'm just really trying to be real this morning and get down where the rubber meets the road and talk about real life issues. Um, I, I desire for the fire and passion of God to fall, but a lot of times I think it doesn't because we're caught up in real life stuff. And, and he, wants to, uh, he wants us to see what he has already done for us and grow in the knowledge of that and we'll be so excited about it that we won't be able to keep quiet. So quickly, let me go over a few consequences because choices have consequences, right? We've talked about that here. We've developed that. Uh, we know that every choice that we make has a consequence, be it good, be it bad. So comparison and the trap of comparison has consequences. Let me share a few of them with you quickly. When I compare myself to others, it robs my joy. Amen. I can be happy in God who... who, who he has made me, what He's given me, where I'm at. But if I begin to compare myself, and this is a ha bad habit of a lot of pastors. There are a lot of burnout comes, a lot of frustration comes with pastors in churches that God has called the pastor 50 or 60 people and be bivocational. But when they try to be somebody that's running 5,000 that God's given a grace to them to do that, they quit. And they, they move on because they've been robbed of their joy. We do it in everyday life. If you will be, continue to compare yourself, a consequence will be it will rob you of your joy. Proverbs 14.30 says, A tender, tranquil heart will make you healthy, but jealousy will make you sick. I don't know too many people. That, the only person that I know that smiles when they're sick is my mom. She, she can keep a smile on her face, but when I'm sick, I don't have too many smiles on my face. Not just physically, but jealousy. When I compare myself and become covetous, uh, have covetousness or envy because of what somebody else has, it begins to rob me of my joy. And Christians ought to be the happiest people on the face of the planet. Uh, unfortunately, comparison causes us to fight. I like this next scripture in James 4, verse 2. You jealously want what others have, so you begin to see yourself as better than others. You scheme with envy and harm, and, and you harm others to selfishly obtain what you crave. That's why you quarrel and fight. If I've ever seen this manifest in this day and time and generation, it's been at the ballpark. With parents whose kids may have less than another kid or they think their kid's better than another kid, and because of that, they get in quarrels and fights. Am I right, Hank? Hank? We've seen it, haven't we? It's, it is unfortunate. All the time, you don't obtain what you want because you haven't asked God. I mean, instead of fighting with Alice over something that I want, if I would just ask my father in heaven, <laughs> he might say, not yet, because you're not having mature enough, but all the promises of God are yes and amen in him. So you have not, is King James language, you have not because you ask not. And so I'm fighting with my brothers and sisters to get something from them, to steal from them, to rob from them. All the time it's robbing my joy and it's causing a quarrel and an argument and a fight with my brothers and sisters. Number three, it leads to chaos. Consequences of comparison, it leads to chaos. James 3.16 says, Any place where you find jealousy and selfish ambition, you will discover chaos and evil thriving under its rule because we're, we will begin to fight with each other, and when we begin to fight with each other, we will undermine each other. We will criticize each other, and when we undermine and criticize each other, instead of building up, I posted yesterday, a kingdom-minded person should always have, be edifying, not crucifying. Amen. Amen. And a lot of times we crucify other people when we compare ourselves to them because we have to blow their candle out so our candle looks better. I want to be superior. God help us. Obviously, it's selfish. 
compares that trap it just as selfish and Paul said in the book of Philippians 2 3 don't be selfish don't live to make a good impression on others be humble thinking of others as better than yourself and really what he's saying there not better as in comparing and measuring but preferring before putting them before yourself why because you're confident in who you are you know who God has made you. You're completely 100% confident in the skin that he's put you in. And because of that, you know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and you prefer your brother better than yourself. That will take care of all comparison, comparing and selfishness. Amen. Lastly, it breeds content. Comparison breeds content. Write this quote down. The beginning of comparison is the end of contentment. When you begin to compare yourself with other people, you, you may have been content with what you had, but now you want what Gary has, and now you're discontent with what you've had simply just by comparing your life to someone else's. So the beginning of comparison is the end of contentment. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 through 7. A devout life does not bring wealth, but it's the rich simplicity of being yourself before God. Since we entered the world penniless, we will leave it penniless. Here we go. If we have bread on our table and shoes on our feet, that's enough. In other words, if God's taking care of your basic needs and necessities, which he said, Paul said, my God shall supply all of my need, all of my necessities are met through the riches of God in Christ Jesus. If I have bread on my table, I have shoes on my feet, and a roof over my head. If you don't have a roof over your head, come and talk to me before the night's end. We will have a roof over your head. And because if, we, if we're not content in those basic necessities, then we'll begin to compare ourselves. And when we compare ourselves, a consequence is it will breed discontentment. And oh, how Americans are discontent. I have literally eaten on the dirt floors in the jungles of Africa with brothers and sisters that were very content. Much more so than I have eaten at people's homes with nice things. But I've eaten in millionaires' homes who have nice things who are very content as well. So just don't make me think, but just because you're poor, you're content. And because you're rich, you're discontent. That has nothing to do with it because, again, we're not comparing. We're thanking the Lord. I've noticed that comparison is dividing the body of Christ, especially amongst our leadership. When pastors and deacons and church leaders compare themselves with other churches and they want what they don't have or they wish that they, your, some of their people would come to your place because they don't want them anymore and vice versa. And we get very discontent in where we're at and what we've been given. It's dividing the body of Christ. And when the body of Christ is divided, it distracts the unbelievers from seeing Christ. When the church is not loving one another, when we can cease to compare ourselves with one another and just serve and love one another, then the Father is revealed. And people aren't distracted there. But as long as we have these divisions and these fightings and these quarrels and there's chaos, um, we're not portraying the love of the Father and people are just blinded to who Christ really is. And bottom line is it's not the gospel. It's just not the gospel. So what is the cure? What's the cure for the comparison trap? I told you what the consequences are. I'm going to give you three things and I'll get out of your way this morning. Cure for the comparison trap. Number one, you have to change your lens. The lens that you have has to change. You have to be cross-eyed. I'll say that again. We need to be cross-eyed. Our lens has been so broken that when we've look, looked through that broken lens at other people and if we are not content with our own lives, what comes through that lens that's broken is judgment. Most judgment doesn't come... If I'm looking at Gary and I'm comparing my life to Gary, and especially if the measuring rod is sin, 
And I know that there, Gary is into something that's obvious and it's very open and you can see it. Then I will judge what I see in his life in comparing it to I think I'm better than him. See that? But if I'm content in who I am and I have cross-eyed vision and my lens is the cross and I filter everything through the cross of what Jesus has done, then it doesn't matter what our possessions are. It doesn't matter what our sin is. It doesn't matter what our behavior is. We're all on the same plane. Different battles, different struggles, but we're all on the same plane. So as God sees us, let's put God glasses on and let's see each other. Matter of fact, I believe over in Corinthians that Paul tells us don't judge or recognize each other through the lens of the flesh any longer. What does that mean? See each other after the Spirit. And he said we used to view Jesus that way. What do you mean? Well, when he was on the planet, I could see him. I could touch him. I, could, I had contact with him, but he's not here any longer. He sent Holy Spirit, and now that Holy Spirit is here we only see Christ through the Spirit so when I look at you if I have the wrong lens on I will judge you because of my own discontentment and when I compare myself to you then I have it's just a trap so instead of viewing yourself less than or better than someone else superior or inferior your frame of reference to eliminate the mindset of competition see we get into competition happened to the disciples after the resurrection who's the greatest who's going to sit on your right hand competition why because they're comparing themselves number two um, stay in your lane and run at your own pace um, over in the gospel of John read it later chapter 21 after the resurrection the boys have gone back to fishing and Jesus shows up on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we're going there October 4th through the 13th next year if you want to go with us, uh, 2020. Uh, it's going to be a great trip, but we've been there. We'll go to that location. Jesus is preparing breakfast for them. The boys recognize him when he hollers at them. They come back to the shore. Jesus deals with Peter and the three times that he's denied him, and he says, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my lamb, feed my sheep. And then Peter, after all of that, compares himself to John and says, what about John? And Jesus says this in chapter 21, verse 21 of John. He says, if I want him to live until I come again, that's none of your business. But I have dealt with you and I have showed you my love and basically stay in your lane, Peter. If you'll stay in your lane, you're, as a runner... Um, Lexi's a runner. I, this this is not a runner. Okay, I ran track in the eighth grade for one track meet. They put me in the eight hundred meters, and they had already started the hundred yard dash on the other side for another group, and I still hadn't finished the eight hundred, and I was done. I played fullback. All you had to do was run people over. You didn't have to be fast, just strong. But I have heard. <laughs> that runners are trained to stay in their lane. Especially in sprints, if you get out, if you tell me if I'm wrong, if you get out of your lane, you're disqualified. Now, there's no disqualification in the kingdom of God, but you will cause others to trip and fall, and you may cause yourself to trip and fall if you get out of your lane. How do you get out of your lane? You start comparing yourself to someone else. Is there a metronome on that keyboard? Look up a metronome. If you're not musically inclined or know what that is, metronome keeps time, and you can set the pace for it. You can set the pace for 94 beats per minute. minute. You ask me, metronome, M-E-T-R-O-N-O-M-E, -E. metronome. Missy knows what it is. She's a musician. And so it can set it for 94 beats a minute, 116 beats a minute. They even use metronomes outside of music, uh, the row crews that row. They have a cadence that they count out at different paces so that they can keep pace. 
And the problem is if J.J. has been designed and God has set his pace at 94 beats per minute and I'm comparing myself to J.J. at 94 beats per minute in his lane and I'm trying to run at 94 beats per minute and God has designed me to run at 160 beats per minute in this lane and I'm trying comparing myself and think I have to be like J.J., I'm going to be very discontent. I'm going to become frustrated. I will be exhausted trying to keep, and, so, and he would be if he tried. And so when we compare ourselves, folks, stay in your lane, run at your own pace. If you don't get anything else this morning, go out of here knowing. See, there are diversity of gifts in the body of Christ, but there's one spirit. We are many members, but we are one body. So stay in your lane. If you will, excuse me, stay in your lane and run at your own pace, you will avoid the trap of comparison. And lastly, Michaela, if you'll begin to play, clarify your values. Change your lens, stay in your lane and run at your pace, and clarify your values. Things like focus on gratitude instead of complaining. Practice generosity. Some of you are not being generous with your time, talents, and treasures. If you value something, uh, matter of fact, I could come to your house and look through your garage and tell you what you value. Because if it's full of hunting equipment, you value hunting. If, if you have season tickets to all of the West Virginia Mountaineer football games, you value college sports. Nothing wrong with that. You can come to my house and you'll find out what I value. Food. It's, we got a f freezer. We like to travel. You know, those are things that we value. But if we haven't clarified that the kingdom of God is first in those things, before those things, then our values are out and priorities are out of whack and then we will end up comparing ourselves to other people. Appreciate and enjoy the blessings that God has given you. Compliment instead of compare. So if someone gets something that you don't have or that you wanted, compliment them. Don't complain about it and compare yourself to them. Stand to your feet. I'm going to leave you with this final thought. From Galatians, the fourth chapter. I'm going to read it from the good, or God's words translation. Each of you must examine your own actions. Pay careful attention to your own work. For then you will be get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. In an age of entitlement, where a generation is being raised that they don't have to do anything, they just get, get, get. And then when they don't get, they're discontent, and they compare themselves to other kids. The average age of a child to receive a cell phone, how old do you think it is? Eight years old. Average age. Why? Because they've compared themselves to another kid at school, and I'm not as popular, I'm not as liked, I might even get bullied and called poor if I don't have a cell phone, and parents will sacrifice and do all types of things to get a kid at eight a phone. When I used to say things like, Dad, everybody's got one, he'd say, no, they don't, because you don't. <laughs> so no, not everybody has one. <laughs> but I like what Lisa shared this morning. Equal faith. We all have it. God's given it. He hasn't withheld anything from you that he's given to me, and he hasn't given me anything that he's withheld from you when it comes to himself. Different gifts stay in your lane. But when it comes to himself, he hasn't withheld any of himself from you that he's given to me, and he hasn't withheld anything he's given to me or given to me that he's withholding from you.
So we're all on the same plane in his eyes. No need to compare. It's a trap. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray and, and just ask the Holy Spirit now. Here's three ways to apply these scriptures and these thoughts this morning. Study them out this week and let the Holy Spirit reveal to you what he wants to reveal to you. Number two, meditate upon them. What's the difference between studying them out and meditating upon them? Studying is receiving the knowledge of it. Meditating on it is meditating on what Holy Spirit shows you as you have studied it out. So as you've studied it out and you've meditated upon it, then put it into practice. And as you put into practice what the Holy Spirit reveals to you, you will begin to have a cure for the comparison trap. I believe you'll become more content. I believe chaos will begin to cease in and around your home and with those that you are dealing with I believe that joy will return there will be less fights it, it's, it's, it's just going to really help you in being less distracted from the abundant life that you can enjoy right now so Father I thank you for helping us this morning to bring some soul health and healing to your people uh, I pray that you would help us uh, Father, in Jesus' name, to apply this to our life so that we can have uh, more joy, contentment, and peace uh, that you have provided for us in this journey here. As heaven comes to earth, we thank you that you're helping us to focus on being more gracious and having more gratitude and being more generous, spending our time, talents, and treasures in the things that we value the most. Give us cross-eyed vision, I pray, that we would filter everything through the cross, that we would not look at others and begin to rate them and rank them, that we would just rest and remember who we are in Christ this morning. In Jesus' name. I want to do a couple of things as you leave this morning. You can respond to the altar. We've prayed for healing and things, but we'll continue to, to pray uh, with you this morning. But would you just pray this? You can pray it out loud. You can pray it to yourself. It doesn't matter. But say, Holy Spirit, help me not to feel inferior or superior to others around me because that doesn't honor you. Holy Spirit, help me to be comfortable in my own skin. Thank you for making me me for using me may I avoid the trap of comparing as I focus on you in Jesus name amen put your hands together thank God for helping you and giving you healing in your soul this morning anything on anybody's heart this morning as we contemplate the last few moments yes I can't hear you. God does not play or swim in the sea of forgetfulness. Yeah. The sins of, are placed in the sea of forgetfulness, and he's not playing out there, and he doesn't swim in it. That's right. Thank you, Missy. That's good. Anybody else this morning, every heart clear? Yes, sir. That was an old saying back home, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah, It's hard to do, especially when I'm a right. <laughs> I love you. I appreciate you. Uh, the reality of this benediction is becoming clearer and clearer and stronger. It resonates with me. Um, when it was first given in Numbers, it was a Levitical priest who proclaimed these things without a Messiah who had come. On this side of the cross, uh, as under the order of Melchizedek, under the leadership of the high priest, Jesus, you are a priest and a king, I am a priest and a king, and we declare with new covenant language that the Lord has blessed you, that the Lord has caused his face to shine upon you, and he is being gracious to you. He has already turned his countenance towards you. He's smiling on you. And he's given you peace. And actually in the language that once he turned his face, James reiterates that there is no shadow of turning. 
wherever you go, you're, he's right in your face. And he's giving you peace. That, that's just such a strong word now that under the new covenant, we're not hoping for it, we're not wishing for it, and we're not even having to pray for it. It's ours for the receiving. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We will see you Wednesday evening. Six o'clock dinner, seven o'clock service. Bless you.